To help us understand how intelligence agencies are working together and with the private sector, we are joined by Morgan Adamski, Director of the NSA's Cybersecurity Collaboration Center, Andrew Boyd, Director of the Center for Cyber Intelligence at the CIA, Laura Galante, Cyber Executive and Director of the Cyber Threat Intelligence Integration Center at the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, and Brian Bordren, Assistant Director of the FBI's Cyber Division. Leading them in conversation, please welcome again Dina Temple Raston, host and executive producer of the Click Here podcast and senior correspondent at The Record by Reported Future. Good afternoon. Uh, we have a very unusual panel here today because it's, uh, we'll be focusing on the role of the intelligence community in addressing cyber threats. Uh, but we rarely get real practitioners to come out into the light and the open to talk to us about what they're doing and how it fits together. And to a certain extent, it feels to me as a former counterterrorism person that um, we're kind of at the same point of inflection in cyber that we were in counterterrorism in, in 2003, in which there was a new kind of coordination, people knew how to work together in a different way, and, and it all coalesced to, to be much more effective. So I wanted to talk about that evolution in the intelligence space when it comes to cyber. And I wanted to start, start with you, Laura. If you could talk a little bit about where we are, how it's developed, and, and then I'll go to each of you and talk a little bit more about your mission space. Thanks, Dina. So this is a big question. How has cyber intelligence evolved? Um, it may, maybe we'll start it a little bit where you did, which was back in the early 2000s. We'll do sort of a two decade. So let me try to cover that waterfront quickly. Um, here's how I like to think of it. So when you go back to kind of this initial era of where cyber intelligence was becoming a term, where intelligence was starting to be um, a concept that we were using to track and, and get behind the forensics of a cyber attack, of exploitation events, of other network operations, you really start to think back to kind of the mid 2000s. And you know, back in the late 90s, there had been Moonlight Maze, some of the Russian operations that had been exposed. But by the mid 2000s, and even up to, I'll just say, kind of the, the first big era's end, 2010 to 2012, you were seeing the PLA in China going after intellectual property theft in a way that was so open, it was so deep, and the targets and the victims were so numerous that intelligence was the concept that security firms, that intelligence analysts were starting to use as they put together what these hacking groups looked like in cyberspace. And unlike in terrorism where you didn't, didn't have you know, faces and events that you could put um, in the public's eye to the same degree, what you had in cyber at that time was infrastructure, IP addresses, um, malware, those who remember Poison Ivy from back in the day, specific tools that started to become the hallmarks of how we tracked these groups. All right, so to fast forward from there, this is when intelligence is sort of beginning to, to draw the confines of the space of what actors are behind network operations. Then we move into sort of the, let's say, the, the kind of modern era that spurs a lot of the different elements of the IC that, that are represented on stage here, right? So cyber's getting tracked in all these different ways through all these different agencies. But then by about 2015, 2016, 2017, you're seeing a maturation both in industry and in government where tracking threat groups whether it's the SVR, the GRU, Iranian actors, criminal actors, is now becoming something that's more synthesized, right? You're seeing the blog post in the exposure paper, and you're tracking that in the same way back on the government space. And intelligence is now the interoperable piece between how threats are being tracked on the private side and how they're also being tracked and how they're being experienced in government. And you know, I, with, without going too deep into that, the era we are now sort of entering today is a space where we're not just tracking right hand, left hand on these different threats that are happening on private infrastructure, on public infrastructure, on government infrastructure, but now the question is, how does, Brian had put this the other day uh, in a nice way, how does a virtuous cycle of taking intelligence behind cyber operations feed incident response? How does incident response data feed cyber intelligence? How does product 
on the security side benefit from the intelligence you're getting as you uh, track these groups. And that's not a new problem, but it's one that I think we are starting to really refine across the group here uh, with the work that we're doing. So I'll stop there as just kind of an initial It's defining. a new response. I mean, it's, a more, it's good to look at this as a new coordinated response, right? We've thought about it in more of a holistic way. Is that the right way to think about it? Yeah, and I think it's the dynamism of the response, not to get too buzzwordish on this, right? But how do you do this with speed? How do you do it in an automated way? How do you take, you know, maybe maybe to, to pitch to Morgan next yeah. on this, like how do you take some of the work that NSA is doing out with, with the um, a, a bunch of different commercial companies in the Div and elsewhere and take the dividends of what they're seeing from their um, own infrastructure, from their own endpoints, and make sure that's fed back into intelligence, into, into classified systems as well and then back out to the companies to say can you deploy something larger can you get us a collective defense approach quickly in an automated way in a fast way so how do we improve that dynamism around intelligence and response let me let me ask the question just slightly differently at a sort of more ground level in the sense Morgan so does it start with you find something and you call the companies or the companies call you and you say yeah, yeah, we're seeing something. So, yeah, how I would describe it really is it, it's a new operating model, right? So when we talk about how we're doing operational collaboration with our private sector partners, what it looks like is really just everybody bringing their understanding and their data to the table and being honest about it. In terms of, I don't know what I'm looking at. This is what I'm seeing. Like, is this significant? Is this something that I should care about? Is this something that you, the National Security Agency, is tracking? Mm. Is it a nation state actor, right? And we're able to have that conversation in an open environment. And from a National Security Agency perspective, right, we, you know, I'll follow the evolution from Lara. You know, 10 years ago, we would produce these exquisite classified intelligence reports. We would disseminate them out to our interagency partners. Some of that information would have technical indicators. We would create a tear line. We'd give it to our partners and say, go forth and do good. <laughs> but we can't answer any questions because we're going to hang out here in a skiff behind a fence line. Right. That's not really helpful, right? We need to be able to engage in those conversations with the technical expertise and the insights if we're the originators of the information. And so what I would say is that fast forward to where we are now, right? NSA, October 2019, decided to stand up its cybersecurity directorate, where we really brought together our foreign intelligence and our mission assurance, our cybersecurity mission together. Um, we now are at a point with the Cybersecurity Collaboration Center where we are engaging 24-7 in a completely unclassified environment with over 300 partners every single day on the big nation state actors, right? Two years ago, that wasn't occurring, you know, when we set up the center, that wasn't occurring at all. Right. We also have a physical facility that sits outside the fence line. If anyone's been to NSA headquarters, you drive up 295 and you see these 12 foot fence and you see these guards and gates and guns, uh, that doesn't scream collaboration. Um, and so- <laughs> It whispers well, it though. Yeah, it whispers <laughs> it in, that, in a non-creepy way. Uh, but what I would offer is like, we wanted a space where people wanted to bring their data voluntarily to engage in that bi-directionally, mutually, mutually beneficial conversation because that's how we connect the dots. Right? It can't just be me taking intelligence and throwing it over the fence right. and saying good luck. That, that's not how we're going to really tackle these hard problems. And do you have a number that you're hoping to get to? You say 300 now. Yeah. So here's the deal. To me, it's not about quantity. It's about quality. Right? If I can work with companies that have the broadest reach, that can protect the most customers worldwide, that's who I need to be sharing intelligence with um, because they're the ones that can action it. Right? right? Obviously, from an NSA perspective, we want to help those small, medium-sized defense industrial-based customers because as a part of the Department of Defense, that is our mandate. But again, it really is how do we take that exquisite intelligence, our technical expertise, put it in the hands of the people who can look at their apertures, understand their networks and their customers, and empower them to action it in a way that really just provides this broad collective defense. Okay, and so if we're sort of following the steps of this, are you better to talk to next, Andrew, sure. or are you, Brian? Sure, in terms I'm of happy how to goes? talk. Okay, please. Uh, um, so as far as mission sets go, I mean, we don't do that. We don't have a public-facing mission. I am the public-facing uh, part of the Center for Cyber Intelligence. Uh, but we do strategic analysis uh, and operations, intelligence collection operations to uh, feed that analytic cycle so that the policy folks 
uh, in ODNI and, and uh, at, at the National Security Council and our other partners in the intelligence community can do their mission, be it disruptive uh, activities against cyber threat actors or, or whatnot. We're in a unique position in CIA. We're a traditionally just strategic analysis and a human, human intelligence organization, but CCI straddles both. We, uh, we are both human, human intelligence collectors and technical collectors, and it's a very unique uh, position in the, in the community wherein you know, we're collecting intelligence on these ransomware actors that we've been talking about all day today, and that nexus between those ransomware actors, some of them are really just criminals, but a lot of them had a, a dotted line or chart relationship to foreign intelligence actors, be it China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, uh, and, and others that are an existential threat to national security in the United States. So that's not all that different than any other mission set that CIA has, wherein we do strategic analysis on a whole variety of subjects, collect intelligence to feed that. What makes us different is the technologists that reside in my organization and the interagency partnerships. I have a number of FBI folks embedded with us, NSA folks, et cetera, where we can feed that cycle. You and I talked earlier today about the parallels between you know, what we're doing in cyberspace and that existential threat with where we were on counterterrorism in the early 2000s. And frankly, it, it was kind of a mess. Uh, we did not have a community approach to counterterrorism in, until you know, maybe not quite the mid-2000s before that, but it took a while. Um, and I think we're farther along with that and evidenced by the folks sitting here and some of the other interagency partners uh, that are part of this. But it didn't happen organically. We had to have a lot of really strong leadership within the community, a really strong understanding of the strengths of NSA, the, str the strengths of ODNI, the strengths of FBI, and the other members of the community. And, and this has been mentioned several times today, the critical difference between the counterterrorism fight and where we are in cyber is the private sector has to be part of this. I mean, because they own all the infrastructure uh, and, the, th and the, the gravest threats, uh, frankly, are against the private sector in the United States. That is different, and thank God for NSA and, 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 and CISA that have these public-facing fa partnerships, because we're just not, we have relationships <laughs> with the private sector, but they're kind of behind closed doors. Right. Um, and we're not positioned in CIA to do what NSA is doing in, uh, with Morgan's team uh, or with what CIS is doing. But we certainly feed that virtuous cycle that Brian has referred to uh, on the intelligence picture. Did you ever think that you'd be saying that the NSA can be more open-facing than you can? <laughs> no, they, they, 10 years ago that was, that was not the case, but there was a lot of visionary leadership uh, at, the NSA, at the NSA that, that uh, which more, you know, Morgan's been part of that uh, evolution. Um, and I'm, I'm just thankful as a taxpayer that the, and, a, and a IC member that that's what's happening. So. Right. I, and, and I'll get to you in half a second. I, I interviewed General Nakasone a couple of weeks ago and he, at the Council on Foreign Relations. And he was talking about how it took a while culturally to understand that you can be more open with the information uh, and uh, it doesn't need to be classified. Parts of it need to be classified, but some of the stuff that can be very helpful to people to stop these attacks doesn't have to be classified. Yeah, and again, when we talk about you know the types of information that our private sector counterparts are really concerned about or they need to be able to better understand the threat, we're talking about technical artifacts, right? When we talk about technical artifacts, typically they're internet facing, they're out there. Most of our private sector partners already know about them. What they really wanna know is, what are the ones that I need to care about? What's coming from a nation state actor? Give me context, give me prioritization, tell me what I need to worry about on any given day and then help me remediate it. And so it is that really signal to the noise is what we say, tons of noise on a network. Right. Help the, help, we wanna help you try to focus on what you should care about because those are the ones that are the most sophisticated and most concerning. So for example, the thing that is in your network, it's not just you, we're seeing it across your entire sector. That yeah. kind of context? Yeah, absolutely. And we, and we do that with our friends at FBI as well because they have such unique insights from a lot of the things that they're doing and what they have historically been out there talking to our private sector partners and so right. we're able to benefit from their lessons learned in a lot of this engagement. Which is a perfect way to get to you, Brian. <laughs> Can you talk uh, a little bit about that? <clears throat> sure. What I'll do is I'll, I'll give you a straight answer on it. And I would just ask for those of you listening to understand that with each element of my answer or my response, intelligence is blended in at every step, whether that's through our domestic government partners, through domestic private sector partners, or global government partners, or global private sector partners. We're often asked, hey, will you collaborate with a private sector partner in Romania or somewhere else if it means disrupting an adversary? And the absolute answer to that is yes. Um, and you don't have to look much further back than uh, Soden Akibi with Bitdefender, which has been published Announced, but from an Explain FBI perspective, Bitdefender. Sorry, I'll get to that. Yeah, okay. 
Um, <laughs> From a mission perspective, right, and you heard our deputy director uh, mention this earlier today, you know, we really in cyber are not your grandparents' FBI, right? So we look at our role as imposing costs through joint sequenced operations with any one of our partners here, international partners, private sector, domestic, international, to change the calculus, the risk calculus for our adversary. And that is actually executed in four specific ways by the FBI. Number one is what I refer to as taking players off the field. And some of you have heard me speak. I always use this analogy, right? Like, I don't like Tom Brady because he always beats my team, but I respect Tom Brady. And if I was playing Tom Brady, I would want to get him off the field, right, to have a chance to beat him, right? Well, we have to investigate, attribute, punish. We are not going to arrest or indict our way out of the process. But that is a role that the FBI will always fulfill and will always resource. Um, just some data, since the start of uh, 2021, we've extradited 21 foreign cyber adversaries to the United States. We're tracking five more for extradition and about two dozen that are currently incarcerated overseas. So it's not a zero sum game where we're not making progress. We are making progress to remove those uh, criminals from the, from the field. Second is we have very unique domestic intelligence authorities that are complementary to NSA and to CIAs. And it should be the taxpayer expectation that we use those authorities not only to inform our public and private sector partners, but to inform operational opportunities based on adversaries beyond on US infrastructure. And that's very, very important for us and something we put a lot of time into, which leads me to number three. The third is we are moving more aggressively into the CNO, CNE space, both reactive, think removing malware from domestic infrastructure, but proactive domestically where Cyber Command fills those authorities' roles internationally. The question is why? Well, two reasons. Number one, <clears throat> because the Bureau is the only organization right now has the authorities to do that work on domestic infrastructure. And two, we think we need to be a closer near peer with CIA and NSA in that space to inform the virtuous cycle that we talked about. And last is, you know, we do need to provide Ritz-Carlton level customer service to everybody up here, but most importantly to victims of cybercrime in the United States. You know, we're 110, 115 years old, victim-centered organization. We take that very, very personally and offering those services to those companies to help them in a time of need, but also to derive the intelligence that we need to feed NSA, to feed CIA, to feed CISA is very, very important. So when we look at this cycle and the blend of intelligence through our traditional authorities as the lead domestic threat response agency in cyber, that's how I would answer that question about feeding that cycle. And, and just to put a, uh, more of a point on that, Solar Winds was uh, using a domestic server, right? So they needed you or the FBI to, to take a look at that. Wasn't it a GoDaddy server for uh, Solar Winds? I'm going to, uh, let me answer that question this way. Okay. I think when we look at the Solar Winds uh, compromise, right, and I, I'm quite sure that Laura, Andy, and Morgan would say the same thing. The best thing that happened in Solar Winds was how the victim responded. And the victim responded with immediate transparency to every one of us, with a full view of the forensics and the intelligence behind what had happened, so that we could all collectively marshal our authorities and our capabilities to deal with the problem set. And you know, as I've matured in my role, and again, I'm quite sure Laura, Andy, and Morgan would say the same thing, what you see is, <clears throat> The organizations that do suffer these very public intrusions, the ones that fare the best are the ones that stand up with broad shoulders and say, hey, I'm going to share immediately and transparently because this is in America's best interest and that's why I'm going to do what I'm going to do. We see that with SolarWinds. We saw that with Kaseya. We saw that with LA Unified School District, like people really, really leaning in and taking a leadership role to fight back. Right. And in, also in the case of Solar Winds, you had two victims. One, mm -hmm. FireEye First, that had a lot of the forensics to understand what it was right away. Right. So that helped too. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I'm trying to carefully do here is try to get you guys to go to specific examples as much as we can do that and you feel comfortable doing that. So can you talk a little bit in practice about specific examples where you were able to coalesce all these different abilities that you have to, to make us stronger? I can start, and um, so what I would talk about, just because it's in the recent past, and I just want to reference my notes here so I don't get anything wrong, but you know, in July of this year, <clears throat> there was a public 
uh, unsealing of three indictments against Iranian nationals. And while that serves as the platform for us to deliver messaging, and when I say us, that is us, plus multiple other countries and multiple other agencies, you know, that the Iranian um, actors, Iranian nationals, right, affiliated with IRGC, likely operating on their own accord for profit, broad targeting through ransomware activity against the United States, Australia, UK, Canada, and Iran. Uh, um, to, sorry, uh, sorry, IRGC, just for people who might not follow. Affiliated with government of Iran. Right? <laughs> um, and so, what you see is people essentially moonlighting for profit, right? Um, but tremendous indiscriminate targeting in the United States, broad U.S. critical infrastructure, even children's hospitals here. Um, and so while we see the, un un the unsealing of the indictments publicly, it leads to a whole host of other activities, both domestically and internationally. And I'll, I'll just mention one thing before I kick it to Morgan to talk about the cybersecurity advisory. But if you saw Director Ray's public announcement of those unsealings, he's a very critical line in there uh, in his announcement. It's a video that says, and other actions we can't talk about publicly. But I think the message of that statement is the coordination that's going on between this group and others to impose strategic costs on our adversaries through both overt and covert means. And it's very, very powerful. But if it's OK, I'll kick it to Morgan to talk about the cybersecurity advisory. Let me ask you just one follow up. And that would be, so because there have been so many of these arrests or indictments, um, is, that, is there a feeling now then that this idea of name and shame, which was something that was with the PLA originally, have we decided as uh, a country that, that that's working, that that actually stops uh, some of this from happening? Um, you know, what I would say is we need to change the decision analysis, the de decision calculus of our adversary. And we're learning more and more over time about how to do that. And so when you look across the US government, right, you have cyber command with specific authorities, CIA, NSA, Treasury, FBI, state. You know, we have all these different authorities and different capabilities. And really the question is, what levers do we need to pull right now to impose maximum costs on our adversaries or to change their analysis? So it's really not a question about name and shame. It's how do we identify strategic, impactful, disruptive objectives and what levers do we pull to get there? So sorry, go Yeah, ahead. no, and I would just offer, right, there are different levers for different adversaries, right? Not, not every lever is going to work against every adversary. You have to really understand what is their hot button issue or what is the thing that's going to make them the most mad. Um, so I think it's awesome to see that we are literally now really comprehending all of the levers we are able to pull and how we can work together and we're able to use that. Um, so just to talk a little about Brian, he obviously referenced um, a lot of the activity around the Iranian cyber actors. I think the one thing that I would pull back and offer is this, um, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about SolarWinds, Log4j, Hafnium, um, all the incidents that have occurred within the past year or so. Um, but one of the things that is most difficult um, as we talk about operational collaboration or public-private partnerships or intelligence sharing is what does that look like when it's not a crisis? Right? What does it look like on the day to day? Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of what that focus is, is what are the key advanced persistent threats, APTs, nation state actors, un, you know, unknown malicious activity that we're trying to characterize? What are those key things that we're concerned about because they're targeting critical infrastructure? And that is a conversation that has to happen first between the intelligence community, the US government, and private sector partners, right? We have to understand what are our joint priorities. We're then able to determine what are the key topics that we need to, you know, what do we need to dig deep in? What do we need to have deep analytical exchange? So a lot of these cybersecurity advisories, like the Iran one that Brian mentioned, right? We are having these in-depth analytical exchanges with private sector partners who are tracking these same groups, who have the same capabilities and apertures to understand what's happening on their customers' networks. And we are having conversations to build that comprehensive threat picture, which is what Laura talked about, right? Is that we are literally bringing all of our different pieces and insights together. And those insights are the ones that are coming out in cybersecurity advisories. Okay. Um, and you know, obviously we don't have DHS CISA on, on the stage here, but they're a key component of that. If you now look at cybersecurity advisories, there are multiple seals 
That's not just because we want to print more paper and put a bunch of seals at the top. It is because that many people are contributing to those analytical products to include our industry members. Mm -hmm. And I think that really speaks volumes to how we are building um, this operating model to understanding the threat, putting out the best mitigation guidance that we can, and kind of moving forward. If we're talking about um, Morgan's priorities and, and how those are with uh, corporations, maybe you can answer this, uh, Laura, or companies. Are the priorities really out of sync that much? I would imagine that they, they couldn't, maybe they are slightly, but are they massively out of sync where you have to make a, a, a sale, I guess, and say this is why this should be your priority? You know, I, I think there's a couple different ways, ways to see the prioritization that um, commercial, the commercial sector has in government. First is, when we say commercial sector, I, I, I actually come from the private side, so I do chuckle a little bit inside when we say industry, because back in the commercial side, no one says industry, sort of has this like outside of government sense, right? right? Um, so I, I think it really boils down to what sector is trying to solve what problem, right? With, um, we'll take Russia, Ukraine, since everyone's lived through it and continues to live through this so often. Um, when you think back to you know, February 24th, the reinvasion and the couple months leading up to that, cybersecurity vendors, Brian's partners, Morgan's partners, Andy's partners, they were well attuned to the Russian APT groups who were likely going to be and were part of a lot of that initial activity. But were satellite communication providers thinking about this? Were other entities um, that, that live in the critical infrastructure space um, that aren't frequently the touch points for security companies or for defense companies or even for energy companies, were they as attuned? They were not. And, and again, we know CIS is sort of missing in this conversation, but they were a big piece in broadcasting out the need for prioritization around Russian APT groups and critical infrastructure targeting. But, to get to the, the little more tactical example around satellite communications, um, what Russia Ukraine provided wasn't just this sort of like toddler soccer ball match prioritization of how does everyone join in for collective defense. What it did is it gave this joint approach that we keep talking about here, and we're talking about successes, but we're all still refining it, right? This is an evolution. It gave us a chance to work those muscles and work them at a tactical level, whether it was sharing malware, whether it was sharing relationships, was whether it was finding new partners. Um, you know, I won't, I won't steal Andy's part, but I'm, I'm sure you added quite a few new folks that you weren't talking to you know, prior to Ukraine. Yeah, to right. to hire new people to yeah. do those. To do <laughs> and probably need more. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, how we started to build out a collective intelligence approach because of the prioritization and clarity of that was something that we're still you know, benefiting from and, and finessing here. Right. I wonder, Brian, if you want to talk a little bit about something that we seem to be writing about all the time, which is ransomware. Mm -hmm. and, and how sort of that fits in with what you're doing in this. Yeah, uh, so again, you know, my, my priorities, again, big uh, nation state uh, uh, competition, China, Russia, Iran, North Korea occupy the bulk of our time. Uh, but after Colonial Pipeline, uh, I know there's a long discussion earlier uh, with TSA about that. Um, but after Colonial Pipeline, uh, the uh, National Security Council asked us to add that to our bucket of priorities. Uh, again, uh, I'm not going to be in the disruptive space uh, on, on ransomware uh, attacks, but where we are is on the intelligence collection space, uh, either human, human intelligence collection, technical collection, partnering with NSA on, on that technical collection, the strategic analysis that's, that goes into that, and then utilizing some of our other private sector partnerships to help infor inform that discussion so that we can have that virtual, uh, virtuous cycle where we can disrupt that ransomware uh, chain. Cryptocurrency, we're in that space as well, analyzing how those cryptocurrency networks work. The ransomware actors, unless they're 100% state-sponsored, they want to get paid. And, and, that, and the only real mechanism that ransomware actors get paid these days is through cryptocurrency. And, and being in that space where we can collect intelligence on how they're using cryptocurrency and whether there is a way for FBI to disrupt that, or as, as Laura was uh, indicating, our international partners. We have global partnerships uh, uh, in, in every capital you, uh, you can imagine across the globe. And either us or FBI you know, provide information to the, those teams. It's different in every country who has the lead on certain issues. But when we can't disrupt it from the US government perspective, we enable our foreign partners to do so. Got it. So if you were to boil down what's different, each of you going down the line, uh, what's different now than a year ago? If you were to boil it down, 
what would it be? Maybe I'll start with you, Laura. <laughs> Sorry, is that? I thought it was going to come to me. I know. I can go to get this one first. No. I just, um, <laughs> look, I've been in my role since May, so I'm going to cheat a little bit and say, look, I've, I've only got six months under my belt um, in, in doing this. But I'll tell you, having, having come back to the intelligence community after 10 years out, what struck me first and foremost was, you know, my, my initial impression was, there are so many more people doing cyber writ large across the IC, and not just the IC, but HHS, EPA. You know, the interagency writ large has um, a, a really strong and I think tight and, and deep community on cyber. And we talk about workforce, and you know, I'm sure everyone on the stage would take good applications from folks out there who want to come into the government and work on this problem set. But we do have a really tight community that can focus um, and that is pretty agile. In, in, in coming from the private side where agility is you know, your, your, your number one strength in a lot of ways to meet customer needs, what have you, I find that the number of agencies that can jump on a problem, and not just in a crisis, to Morgan's point, but to jump on hard problems like ransomware, right? And say, look, that might not be my priority every day of the week. It might not be my strategic priority in five years, but I'm willing to go and put resources on to try to think through how my agency's authorities and work and people can be applied to this problem for X reason, right? And that kind of problem solving and thought process across the interagency has something that has, has really been um, exciting, frankly, to see and to come back to. And I think we've got a lot more to do, but that germination of kind of the, the spirit around how we do intelligence better in this space across the government is something that I think we're really building here. Okay. How about you, Brian? You've been quiet. <laughs> <clears throat> I'll give you uh, one thought internal to the FBI and then one thought about cyber real large. So internal to the FBI, you know, with, you know, the mission and the strategy that I described in my opening response, you know, that was really kicked off in September of 2020. And I think the Bureau is uh, rightfully very proud of its history, right? And that is a law enforcement history. Post 9-11, it's also law enforcement intelligence. Um, but obviously moving into the space of how do we apply unique authorities for the Bureau, specific capabilities for the Bureau in tandem with, again, government, domestic, international, private, domestic, international partners for maximum impact, that's a huge cultural shift, right? And I'm just really proud of our people for wrapping their hearts and mind around that and trying to become part of the solution. So that's the internal thought. The external thought is that um, I've been in my job for 18 months, 19 months about, um, and even during that time, you've seen a maturation of process, um, you know, not only process amongst us, but certainly if CISA was up here, they would tell you the same thing. Certainly Cyber Command would tell you the same thing. Um, an evaluation of when those uh, authorities should be applied as part of that deconfliction or coordination process for maximum impact. Um, but then also, how do we effectively integrate with the private sector and understand their equities and respect their equities, whether victim or not, but also um, bring them into a fold and allow them to be brought into a fold in a way that they're amenable to, that allows them to be part of the solution in a way that they feel good about, rather than saying, hey, this is what we need from you. Right. So it's a much more collaborative, process-driven environment that I, I do credit just maturation of the industry, including right. the government, but also um, people's hearts and minds being in the right place. Right, and the thread has changed a little bit too. If I can have the two of you just talk quickly, because I do want to get to questions, because most people don't get to talk to you. <laughs> okay, I'll be very quick. So um, just to pivot off of what Brian talked about from a culture perspective, right? The, pande the pandemic gave us one good thing. It forced a lot of the national security agency to operate in an unclassified environment to communicate with our workforce that was home. We were able to take those processes in that environment and really pivot to being able to leverage that to share with our private sector partners. So the culture shift from an intelligence community perspective to getting us to share more of our information directly has been significant for us in the last year. Um, secondly, we've really started to figure out what works. It's not perfect to Lara's point, but we've started to see a lot of success on, you know, Brian has been phenomenal because he's gone out to the field offices and he said, here's what NSA is doing. We'll tell you probably the first time the field offices were like, what do you mean NSA is doing that? But they now are tipping us directly when they have information to help in our operations. It, it's phenomenal in terms of how we just have the information going back and forth. Um, and then lastly, really our industry partners are a force multiplier in the fight. 
right? We, we already have a deficit in the workforce, and we've got to be able to band together, use the technical expertise that is inherent both in the U.S. government and in the private sector to really get after this threats in a way we've never done it before, um, while we continue to build that workforce for the future. And quickly, sorry. So, uh, yeah, what's changed in the year uh, for us is the Russian invasion of Ukraine. That's changed everything. Uh, the force buildup that was happening exactly a year ago um, when we decided as a government uh, to start using intelligence as a weapon, so to speak, to convince our allies and to convince, frankly, the American public that this is a real thing, a real existential crisis, and that's a hard place for us to be in the intel community. We don't like to share classified material with uh, with the press, but we did, <laughs> and I think it was it, it was a brilliant uh, leadership right. decision uh, that was you know made at, at, at the NSC. Secondly, from an analytic perspective, kind of reevaluating what did we get wrong, what did we get right, and why, and what are our assumptions? We've talked about this a bit earlier, and Mika uh, talked about this uh, earlier. So we we as an, in the analytic community are kind of going through that. Like our our, our expectations are different now. Um, and then secondly, how we, how we partner, or thirdly, how we partner uh, in this really large community, our bilateral partnerships, our Five Eyes partnerships, right. um, and throughout the U.S. government to work on, on, on this problem set. And then uh, finally, and this is, was discussed earlier as well, just the enormity of the cyber landscape, um, the hacktivist community, the, the IT sector that got involved in the fight, both on the Russian side mm -hmm. uh, and on the Ukrainian side, and what does that mean from an intelligence collection perspective, also from a cyber defense perspective on the U.S. end, right. uh, and how we can, frankly, turn those relationships into an additive uh, thing for conflicts in the future. And I, I think, you know, we're going to be doing a retrospective on the Ukraine crisis for quite some time. Um, the history of it is being written now, um, but I, I think a, a several years from now, uh, we'll, we'll, we will all look back on this as sort of a pivot point in international relations and how the intelligence community feeds into that. Right. I agree. Maybe we have a time for some two quick questions. I would also say that one of the things that's going on is you bring up the lights. Uh, someone can re uh, raise their hands if someone has a question. Anybody? While you're thinking of that question, I'd say I also think the other thing is the audience has changed, right? That now the people that you're talking to and collaborating with have a greater understanding than they may have had even a year ago, and a more understanding of the threat. And certainly we're seeing that of the average person who didn't care about cyber before, but now their schools are getting hacked, so they have to care. Somebody have a question right back there? Um, just wait for the microphone, please, just so everybody can hear you. Hi, when you talk about technical information sharing, how do you decide what level of context is appropriate to provide with that technical, whether it be IOCs or any other sort of technical information with the private sector so that they can use, um, use that information more actionably? Um, so for us in particular, uh, this has been the beauty of the relationship is that by us sharing information, um, directly with a lot of our partners. They give us feedback and say, hey, this is not the type of data I need, or this is the type of information I need, or can you put this in a different format? So that feedback has actually enabled us to produce more valuable information for them. Um, what I will tell you that we have learned over the past year is you know, specifically being able to tie it to an APT group um, our specific nation state actor is critical because that provides context. It doesn't have to be, you know, this individual on the keyboard, it's this APT group. Um, a lot of companies that we work with, especially in the defense industrial base, have specific playbooks for how they deal with specific APT actors, and so that context helps. Um, and again, we are able, we've had a lot of success recently on being able to share that type of information at a very low classification. Other question? Uh, yes, right here. Uh, oh, sorry. Right there. Thank you. Sorry, it's hard to see. Thank you. Hello. Um, so coming from a small country, Greece, and uh, with a small country with a limited budget, actually, uh, what would you suggest is the uh, key area in which countries with, like Greece with limited budgets should focus on in order to um, have a sustainable um, cyber uh, security, um, an enforced uh, sustainable cyber security. Thank you. 
I'll take the first crack at it. I'll channel my inner Sissa in my answer to, to you. Uh, listen, I think it comes down to fundamentals, right? You know, whether that's <clears throat> MFA, you know, air gap backups, you know, um, these types of things. Those fundamentals, I probably rattle off a list of seven or eight, but those are, those are the difference makers, right? And when you look at the compromises that all of us hear about, uh, see, you know, they all come back to a traditional set of vectors and the most fundamental way to protect against those vectors is those foundational security principles. Anybody want to add to that? I think just to add one piece to what Brian uh, rightfully said there was, um, you know, the question is build versus buy, and where do you want to accept risk, on, particularly on the buy piece? And there's risk on the build piece too, right? But that calculation, and I think sharing how countries like Greece and other countries with a more limited budget who want to get the fundamentals right and want to learn from other countries on how they have made those risk decisions, I think those lessons shared is something where, um, you know, there's a variety of a forum that are forums that are starting to to get those lessons out, but that's a place where I think we could um, generally start to share more, right? On this sort of joint capacity building, we haven't figured it out yet fully, in you know, in the U.S. government either. But how we start to um, think through best practices together, think through what interoperability looks like between sharing APT groups, between sharing um, you know forensics that we're seeing, between private sector sharing with our government, uh, those are all lessons that I think will be really applicable as more and more governments build out their programs. So I can just Quickly, yeah. Add, yeah uh, so, and, and we talked about Albania uh, earlier. I mean, I do think from a U.S. government perspective, we learned some lessons there. Is every one of our embassies overseas prepared for a situation like that? And I think the answer was, was no. And back to our counterterrorism examples, um, every embassy on the globe knows what to do in a counterterrorism situation. Everybody has their points of contact in the foreign government. Uh, foreign governments there, be it military, intelligence, or, or uh, diplomats. Um, we do not have the muscle memory on that yet when it comes to a, a cyber crisis. We're getting there, um, but we're using existing you know, representatives in all our embassies to sort of build that. But that has been a focus for some uh, folks on my team, is to educate our embassies overseas as to what to do in a crisis like that so that we can help our allies. And again, this isn't a Greece example, it's an Albania example, but to help our allies either prepare so that they don't have an incident like that, but in the event of an incident, they have an appropriate response. So. And you know, you talked about a virtuous cycle. Actually, the four of you coming out and talking about this adds to the virtuous cycle. I think that, that if people understand how this works together, I think it'll bring more people to you to talk about it. And so thank you very much for being here. And please join me in thanking Morgan, Andrew, Laura, and Brian. <laughs>